On this edition of Independent Sources, Pot Culture, the campaign who curbed convictions and arrests for small amounts of marijuana in New York City. I think it's a continuance of an acknowledgement that our marijuana policies are broken and our young people should not be um, the collateral consequence associated with it. And from tragedy to triumph, a Holocaust survivor's hope that her dog past can light up a better tomorrow for at-risk teenagers. When I came to school, they said to me, what do you offer us? They checked me out because they're good kids, but they, a lot of them are street kids and are very successful. I said, if I help one of you, I'm fine. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Attitudes toward marijuana around the country are changing. 20 states allow pot to be used for medical purposes. Colorado and Washington state have legalized the drug for recreational use, and New York is reportedly considering following the lead of those two states. In the meantime, there seems to be an easing of prosecutions of people found with small amounts of cannabis. The Amsterdam News recently reported that Brooklyn DA Ken Thompson said he would not prosecute people found with less than 20 grams of marijuana. I sat down with Amsterdam News Editor Nayaba Arende and Cassandra Frederick of the Drug Policy Alliance join us via Skype. We talked about the change in policy on policing marijuana and the overall effort to get the drug legalized. Nayabe, recently you wrote a piece in the Amsterdam News about uh, Brooklyn DA Thompson uh, proposing not to prosecute people or court with 20 gram of marijuana or less. Is that a major development? If so, why? It is because he's saying that when you arrest these mostly black and brown individuals with 20 grams or less, it blocks up the system. You get, he said, first of all, he's going to dismiss them. He's not even going to prosecute them. Because there's, there's been a, book on, a law on the books since 1977 saying don't arrest people. Or you can arrest them, but they're not going to be, nothing's going to happen. It's not a jail offense, it's not an arrestable offense, so don't do it. So Ken Thompson is saying, listen, if you arrest them, I'm going to dismiss those cases unless there's an outstanding warrant or criminal activity involved. Mm -hmm. It clogs up the system, you get these young people involved in the criminal justice system, and it's a waste of time, and they, and they get a record when they don't need one. So it's a huge deal, and we spoke to some of the other DAs, and some of them responded, some of them did not, because um, MRPD Commissioner Bill Bratton is kind of umming and ahhing about it. Um, Mayor, uh, Mayor de Blasio. De Blasio, yeah. the other one Mayor, The other one, yeah. <laughs> Mayor de Blasio said, well, I've not listened to paperwork. Give me a minute. I'm uh, really, we really were. Oh, we're all on the same page. Cuomo said, listen, I'm kind of on the same page too. Um, Assemblyman Karim Kamara has a bill mm -hmm. saying that they shouldn't be arrested for these low-level possession of marijuana. Um, but it was voted out in the Senate. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing battle. Okay. Cassandra, is this the beginning of a movement to legalize marijuana in the New York State? I think what this is the beginning of is us trying to deal with how to break um, end our broken marijuana policies. Um, marijuana was decriminalized in 1977 because a lot of young people were getting arrested and needlessly being involved in the criminal justice systems. So mothers lobbied their district attorneys, who then lobbied the legislators, to say that this is no longer, this should not be a reason why my child is being taken out of the community and being put into the criminal justice system. So we've had this law for over 35 years. So I don't think it's a beginning of a movement. I think it's, I think it's a continuance of an acknowledgement that our marijuana policies are broken and our young people should not be um, the collateral consequence associated with it. These arrests can get a child kicked out of public housing. They can lose their financial aid. They, um, it blocks them from certain jobs and licenses. So I think what the movement is, is really us in New York really continuing the conversation about how marijuana prohibition um, is not, is costly, um, and it doesn't do what we want it to do. Uh, recently, you had uh, a protest. Can you tell us about that and how the turnout and what kind of message you want to come get across during that rally? So, um, District Attorney, um, the Brooklyn District Attorney Ken Thompson, 
had a memo that outlined his new his proposed policy that would stop the prosecution of low level marijuana arrests. And that memo was leaked, was shared with the press, and we um, were made aware of it. And we held a press conference and rally in support of the proposal um, on the steps of Brooklyn Borough Hall. And it was attended by community members, public defenders, elected officials, everyone just celebrating um, and, you know, encouraging um, Brooklyn DA Thompson um, that his bold and innovative step was needed in New York. Uh, marijuana arrests are not going down in a way that's substantial. Um, and his leadership on this matter is something to be celebrated and something we hope we can encourage other law enforcement officials to follow suit. Now, Abby, in your reporting, do you think what Cassandra is saying is, 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 is the way that it's moving? Absolutely. I mean, the support that came out, as Cassandra said, was amazing. It was across the board. It was lawyers. It was residents. It was people passing by. It was, it was elected officials. It was advocates. It was, I don't smoke or, or myself, but there were a lot of people who were really in support of decriminalizing smoking marijuana, possession of marijuana. Um, and, and it was just a really, it was a grassroots feel. Now, to get, what he needs to do is be able to get the other electeds on board, maybe, maybe the other DAs on board. Okay, so Queen's DA said, listen, when we get these cases, we usually try and dismiss them eventually. Bronx DA said the same thing. Manhattan DA didn't respond. Staten Island DA said, we don't comment on other people's policies or whatever. So the grassroots swell, it seems to make sense, especially since it's been on the books since 1977. So the fact that officers will, have, will stop somebody, tell you to turn out your pockets, now the weed, if you have it, is in public view, and that becomes the offense. But you told me to take, take it out of my pockets. So apparently that's illegal. So I think the DA wants to try and stop this activity. So these kids don't get caught up in a system which will affect them for their entire lives, especially since it's applied uh, dis disproportionately. Right. So you get them in East New York and Bed-Stuy and Brownsville, mm -hmm. but not in other areas. So sure. you're targeting and it's profiling. Sure. Now, Cassandra, does the city, can the city gain from legalizing marijuana? And if so, why? How? I think everyone, I think the state can gain from legalizing marijuana. Um, and I think the way that we gain from that is the end of criminalization of um, young men of color. 86% of these arrests are young black and Latino young men, 70% under the age of 30, 52% between the ages of 16 and 22. Um, I think we gain a lot in you know, unshackling um, a whole community. Um, especially young men of color. Marijuana prohibition um, is not about marijuana. It's always been about the social control and the perception of who uses marijuana. Government you know, data shows us that it's young white males that smoke and use, smoke, use, sell, and possess marijuana at higher rates. Um, but our criminal justice system is mo is over. We are overrepresented, and when I say we, I mean young communities of color. So I think uh, one of the what, parts benefits we can get from that is the end of criminalization or the starting of ending criminalization of communities of color. If you told me in 2014 that we're still having issues about marijuana because most of the leaders in the country now, whether it's in media or politics and, and, and business, uh, we grew up at a time where smoking marijuana was really the norm in college. Mm -hmm. And so by now, uh, a lot of people expected marijuana, this conversation to be sort of like, been there, done that. Why are we still having this conversation about well, like, marijuana? Like Cassandra said, it's about targeting communities of color. They've got states, beds of state in those prisons to fill. So they've got to keep those quotas rolling. So if you keep a target a certain audience, you know you're going to have those, those beds full and you're going to keep that upstate economy flowing. So there is a, a perception that marijuana is, you know, recreational drug and Colorado will tell you we've made so much money. Amsterdam. In Am <laughs> Amsterdam thinks everybody's crazy over here, so it's not a big deal. So, I mean, I think the move is to, to eventually legalize it in, in the state. Cassandra, what kind of structure need to be put into place for this movement to be successful, for, for marijuana to be legalized not only in New York State, but all across the country? I think one of the greatest things that we've learned from the end of alcohol prohibition is letting the states decide what they want to do and what's going to work for them. We don't have a model alcohol system 
um, in this country. Um, and we've been able to let other states figure out what works for them. So Colorado has a very different model than Washington has. And I think if we're going to move forward with marijuana legalization, then we should let the states experiment to see what works and what doesn't work so that people can have different ways to deal with it. Thank you, Cassandra Frederick. Nahaba Arende, thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Still to come on the show, Norwegians in New York mark a milestone. Before that, Abby Shola has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. Some merchants in Chinatown are complaining about senior citizens who pick through their trash. The China Press reports that it's common to see Chinese seniors sifting through trash in Chinatown, but business owners say the issue is creating an unclean environment in the area. Baoling Wu, the spokeswoman for the Project Open Door Senior Citizen Center, says the issue isn't new, and it's not because these people are poor. She explains that many were born in the 1940s and 50s and faced hardship. Therefore, they are used to being thrifty. There's a change of plans for the controversial Islamic Cultural Center near Ground Zero. France Amarique reports that the real estate developer Sharif El Gamal has decided to build a museum dedicated to Islamic culture instead of the cultural center. This after people protested the project for years. El Gamal tapped renowned French architect Jean Novel to design the project that will include a prayer room, public green space, and a room for events for the city's Muslim community. The Greenpoint Gazette profiled one woman who is planning to make Polish history and culture the center of attraction for Poles in New York City. Marta Pawlicek is organizing a six-month-long project to expose Poles living in Greenpoint to their history and culture through educational workshops, concert series, film screenings, and recreational activities. Pawlicek came up with the idea after volunteering at a public library in Greenpoint where she met older Polish residents who spoke about a sense of disconnect from Polish culture. The free event began last Sunday and will run through December. Imagine going to a dance party on a Wednesday morning just before heading to work. A new party company has made that idea a reality. Morning Glory raves are early morning sober parties held at the Kinfolk 94 gallery space in Williamsburg. Annie Fabricant, co-founder of the New York branch of Morning Glory, got the idea to host the parties after attending one in London. She says the parties offer a wave of positive energy and will be held once a month. Ravers get to dance from 6.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. for a $20 cover charge. Those were just a few headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned. May 17th will mark 200 years since Norway gained independence from Denmark. Every year, Norwegians in New York celebrate with a parade on 3rd Avenue and Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Parade organizers are expecting large crowds on Sunday the 18th, the day the event will be held this year, even though many Norwegians have moved away from the neighborhood. I spoke with Victoria Hoffmo, the founder of the Scandinavian East Coast Museum, about why Norwegians are leaving and their contributions to the city. You know, Victoria, New York is a very diverse city, and we talk about that a lot on the show. But one group we never talk about is the Norwegians. Yes, we're, we're, we're considered um, hidden under a bushel. One of the journalists, Rieg, had said at one time, and that was said maybe 60 or 70 years ago. Um, there is a thing in Scandinavian culture called Jenteloven, people's what law. Is that? Uh -huh. And it means that you're not supposed to brag. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes through in that way often. So uh, a lot of times they don't really toot their own horn. But at one point, there was a pretty distinct group in the city. They live mostly in Sunset Park and Bay Ridge area. Uh, where are they now? Well, I think you have to realize they came here with the Dutch early on. There's one connection with them for sailing, et cetera. So they came anywhere where the waterfront was generally with the shipping. Why is that? Because there were sailors. Uh, Norway was not independent for almost, I think, 500 years. I believe it was 400 under Danish rule and 100 under Swedish rule. During the Black Plague, from what I make out, they lost their royal line and they adopted a Danish king. And from that time, they were kind of took the back order to the other two countries. The other two had empires. And so you don't see the same kind of universities developing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But also, even though it's a very beautiful country, it's very hard to farm. Mm -hmm. So the oldest son generally got the farm. And if you have 13 or 14 children, everybody has to find a place to work. And often they went to see the, the men. And uh, where did they move uh, to New York? 
They started moving. They actually, Henry Hudson had a Norwegian sailor on his boat. He was a 14-year-old man from Arendal. His name was Ian Smolk, who became a very famous explorer later in life. And then when they started to settle in New York, they st started to come in. So Bergen Street, for instance, is the Bergen Farm. is from Norway. And uh, they married into the Vanderbilts, et cetera. So I think we forget that New York was a very cosmopolitan place under the Dutch. Even though it was small, it was very mixed. Well, it's always been uh, New York's identity. But you, you, you have a Norwegian parade in, in, in Brooklyn. Yes. Tell us about that and, and who participates and are there any Norwegians in that parade? Yes, we're left. Of course, as all New Yorkers, we start to become diluted. So, for instance, my grandparents came from Norway about 1932. Uh, my mother's side is half Danish Swedish, so I'm three quarters Scandinavian. But they met here in New York, in Brooklyn, when they came around 1900. And then I'm also German, Irish, and French. So you start to have that kind of dil dilute um, blood. But the the Norwegians have uh, been doing the parade. This is our 62nd year continuously. Mm -hmm. They had parades in the 1800s, late 1800s, but they weren't consistently done. And it used to run along 8th Avenue and then 5th Avenue, and that's on 3rd Avenue. In between Sun Sunset Park and Bay Ridge. Okay. Because uh, when I was a child until the early 70s, Sunset Park was Bay Ridge. How do you, how do you organize a parade for a group of people uh, that's really very small? Is, and by the way, is the parade getting smaller or larger? Actually, I see a revitalization with a lot of things, which okay. is interesting. But it depends on the leadership, of course. And Arlene Rutolo is, uh, Arlene Baca Rutolo is actually the, the president this year. She couldn't make it today, so I'm a fill-in. And <laughs> no. uh, she really organizes everybody. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the truth, we have very good participation. We meet about once a month for about eight months of the year. And I would say... We have 50 to 60 people coming to help out in the parade. People come from, of course, Brooklyn, Staten Island, Long Island, Jersey, sometimes upstate to, to organize the parade. It's based on three different groups, basically. The Sons of Norway Lodges, the church groups, and the civic organizations. And in very Scandinavian fashion, we rotate who comes first every year in a very fair way. So it does take a lot of work, but there's also a lot of participation. How many people turn out for the festival? I would say several thousand. It goes um, for about a mile and a half, maybe. So there's certain places that are, of course, more um, concentrated. But we've, what we've been finding happening is that more and more people are coming to Brooklyn to celebrate from outside the city as well as from Norway. We have people coming here like a destination for that weekend. And my organization, the Scandinavian East Coast Museum, has a Viking Fest the day before. So it's a good weekend to do a lot of things. Is there anything special for the 200th anniversary? Um, the, I think the special thing is every year we have a pin. The theme, of course, changes every year. So the, the pin this year is very beautiful. It's only like $5. It helps raise money. But it has a traditional, I can say correctly, sloifa. It's ribbon that they do in Norway often. And it's very beautiful with the, the crest of the, of the lion. Do you have any fears that in the years to come that this parade won't be organized? No. <laughs> Why is that? Because I think people like Arlene, myself, and many, many others are very determined to keep it going. Um, you know, it's not about us having large numbers, it's about what we contribute to the city. And as you say, we're very um, underdocumented. Even with the state, with the documentation program they have, we were considered undocumented mm -hmm. with archival things. So we feel very strongly about keeping that going. Um, you know, we're third generation, fourth generation in many cases, but we feel we're very much a part of the city. And because we've been underrepresented in many ways, we want to make sure that we are. And I think that, especially the neighborhood of Bay Ridge, has kept so many of the Scandinavian and Norwegian ideals in terms of social responsibility. So many of our institutions and the built environment comes from them. We're not aware of. So anything you're doing to make sure that it doesn't end? I think we have the bylaws, of course, but because of the, um, we try to include more people in every year, get younger people involved, different organizations. We reach out to organizations who don't show up sometimes or are far away. And there's one woman, um, who has started doing a, a phone call before every single meeting to see what people are up to and to make them feel welcome to come. But I don't see that there's less participation. I see it's growing. Um, people come down. When they take it very seriously. We have one thing we have that's very special in the parade is we have the Norwegian and American flag across the avenue in the middle of the street. It's very, very beautiful. We do that with the, the people with the cherry pickers, so we're actually doing hands-on things. So that's very much a part of our culture to keep that going and as well as to give back. And through the parade, we get to feature all those p things we've been responsible for and been involved with. So much of the mission work um, and things like that. Yeah. What has been uh, the contribution of Norwegians in the city? I mean, can you just say, okay, this thing yeah. that you, you, you enjoy so much or this? I would say possibly three ways to look at it in terms of groupings, maritime history. I mean, 
the Dutch got their wood and their granite from Norway. There's a saying that if you turn over Amsterdam, it's built on a Norwegian forest. So they came in early on with the Dutch to, and did the shipping. They were the third and fourth largest merchant fleet in the world, even though they weren't independent for many years. So that came to New York, absolutely. Um, New York grew because of its harbor. <laughs> we forget that because we're so detached from it. And I would say a fair reason that the Norwegian community started to, to get diluted is not because everybody moved away, but they also put the shipping in New Jersey. They cut the heart out of the community in so many ways with government decisions. Um, putting the Verrazano Bridge to the heart of the community, 2,000 homes being lost. A lot of things happened that impacted that community that maybe the immigration wouldn't have been so uh, large, but they still would have been intact. Mm -hmm. um, however, here we are all these years later, and it's one thing to start uh, institutions, et cetera, but our second thing is our social responsibility. Lutheran Medical Center, all the old age homes, children's homes, mission churches, all those things came from the Norwegians. And the third thing is the built environment. People talk often about Italian and Irish, but we were here much longer than they have been, and they were very instrumental in the construction, carpentry trades. Clapboard architecture mm -hmm. comes from Norway, not the Dutch. They didn't have wood. So, you know, we've been there a long time. There were two engineer societies in Bay Ridge, a Swedish and a Norwegian engineer society. Um, one engineer developed almost every tunnel to um, New York was uh, Singstead. And also Woolworth Building, engineers from those countries were involved, as well as maritime engineers. So they have played a very large part, as you said, but they have been definitely overlooked. Victoria Hoffma, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you. Come to the parade. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, one woman's harrowing tale of survival and how she's trying to inspire a younger generation. Finally from us, Tikam Olam is a Hebrew phrase that means repairing the world, a daunting task at best. But one woman is making a valiant effort to repair her little corner of the world by using her own life story to teach inner city teenagers some important history. Nikki Miller has the story. What does it mean to survive? What does it mean to live? For Fania Gottesfeld Heller, it means speaking for the millions that didn't live to tell their story. I'm almost 90 years old, and I'm one of the last survivors who can bear witness what happened to this destruction of Jewish people in Europe. Six million people, one half million children. When I come to school, I put a face to the suffering. I was there. Each of us has to be his, be his brother's keeper, no matter what language, what color, what profession. We are all the same. It's this message of tolerance and understanding that Heller documented in her acclaimed autobiography, Love in a World of Sorrow, and shares with schools and groups around the world. It's a lesson she knows all too well. 1939, the war broke out. I was 15 years old. So um, all of a sudden, I had to see what happens when evil takes over. What happens when humanity disappears. Born into a traditional Jewish family in a small village in the Ukraine in 1924, she and her family hid from the Nazi death squads through the kindness of a Christian rescuer, Isidore Sokolowski, who lived in their village. Isidore, who was a primitive peasant, couldn't sign his name. He risked his life to save our life because helping a Jew was punishable by death in order to scare the population. They would, they would hang him with the whole family with a big sign, I saved the kite. Ask yourself, would I have been so incredible good and would I have taken a Jewish family to hide if I knew that the Germans can hang me any minute? I don't know. I don't know the answer. 
Isidore took in Fania, her parents, and her brother, first in his attic, then in his barn, and when it became too dangerous, he dug a hole outside. They lay in that crouching position for two years, four of them in a space meant for two, freezing in the winter, baking in the summer. The hunger was excruciating, and she thought of giving up many times. This student wants to know how were you able to survive in such a small space without giving up? What kept you motivated to keep living? For life is very, is incredible. I wanted to know what love is. I wanted to study medicine. I wanted to help other people. We wanted to live. The town had 5,500 inhabitants, 1,500 Jews. From the 1,500 Jews, only 45 survived. For all my kids in the Hebrew school, only two of us survived. And I'm now 89, and he's also, I think he's 88. So soon there'll be no, nothing left. It's for this reason Heller, a great-grandmother of 15, feels an obligation to educate the next generation. When I go to schools, they want to know, can it happen again? We have to tell the, our children who they are where they're coming from, and that, that evil begets evil, that you have to have kindness. You're very inspiring and motivating because you went through so many things, and I know it hurts you. Yeah. And it hurts me right now. Yeah. And for you to go through all those things and be able to move on, you're very strong and brave. I am. And to accomplish so much degrees, that you have accomplished yes. it inspires me to go to college and to do everything I have to do. As much as she hopes to inspire, she says that she gets inspiration from them in return. When I came to school, they said to me, what do you offer us? They checked me out because they're good kids, but they, a lot of them are street kids and are very successful. I said, if I help one of you, I'm fine. What I offer you, hope because I come from artists and destruction, and, 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 and love. So from the love, they are <laughs> line themselves up with hugs and kisses. They got the upper respiratory, upper respiratory infection, but it's worth it. In October 1997, Fania was reunited with Isidore's daughter, Hanya, at Yad Vashem, Israel's official memorial to the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. Isidore Sokolowski was enshrined there as a righteous among the nations, an honor given to non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. It's a, a sign that even in evil, they're good people. And without their, their example, there's nothing to left to leave for our children. They need hope. For independent sources, I'm Nikki Miller. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.